Welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It is a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, he's a complex frequency function to say the very least. It's my co-host, Frank Gaylard. Hello, Andrew. Is today about physics? Because I absolutely love a good Fourier transform. Uh, it is about physics, mate. So it's, uh, it's going to be excellent. very exciting for you. Uh, yeah, we've got an episode which is an interview with medical imaging physicist, a proper PhD doctor, Zoe Brady. Not like us. <laughs> yeah, Zoe works at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and actually started at exactly the same time as me. Feels like yesterday, but it was actually 15 years ago. Uh, which is depressing. Hmm. So she's been revolutionary in growing the field of medical imaging physics in Australia. And so I thought it would be great to have her on for a chat. But instead of me interviewing her, I decided to enlist someone who actually knows a lot more about physics. And so that person is Matt Skowski, actually. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So Matt's an MSK radiologist, um, but he's been teaching an imaging physics course in the US for many years. So I paired Matt and Zoe together for this episode. I gave Matt a few little leads on what to talk about. And uh, I warned Zoe that Matt can go a little bit rogue. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, otherwise, indeed. I just uh, left it to them. And now we all get uh, the benefit of, of listening to their chat. Now, before we do that, though, if we're going to talk about mm -hmm. physics, can we just talk briefly about the Starship launch? Oh, yeah. Did you follow that at all? The day after, not not actually in the middle of the night. Oh, no, no, no. That's not how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? So it was about uh, midnight, I think, local time that it took up. And I had um, I spoke to my two boys who are 12 and 10 and asked them if they wanted to be woken up for the launch. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a very long discussion about this because the previous time that I asked them if they wanted to be woken up for something, it was the last race of the Formula One two years ago, the one that ended with Hamilton losing by one point and it was all a debacle. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, yes, please wake me up. And so at 2 a.m. or whatever it was, I went up to them and I sort of nudged them awake and both of them were like, oh, I don't want to go, I just want to sleep. <laughs> no. And then the next morning they didn't remember the conversation and they were absolutely livid yeah, yeah, that yeah. I had let them sleep in. So this time it was like, do you really want me to wake you up regardless of what you say? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so at midnight, I'm there shaking them awake and they're yeah. like, I don't want to get up. And it's like, no, God damn it, you're getting up. We're watching I've got, this. I've got informed consent from previous you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, we got up all in our jammies sitting on the couch and uh, it was very impressive. I mean, it's a big rocket. It's the, the, the biggest rocket. And unfortunately... It was not only did it explode or didn't, it, <laughs> but the, even the explosion was not as big as I kind of thought it might hey. be. And I think that's because methane burns so much cleaner than kerosene or other rocket fuels because it was just like a bit of a, a, a cloud of like steam. But didn't it explode the whole of the rocket? Yeah, th th they actually terminated it because um, th the problem was actually the rocket worked fine probably, but the rocket engines blew apart the concrete at the base and right. chunks of concrete destroyed three or four of the engines before they even started. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, it's sort of a stage zero failure. The shape of the rocket is interesting. I think they went for a little bit of style over the actual aerodynamics. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Musk said that um, there's that Borat movie, I think, where he's talking about rockets having to be pointy. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, apparently Musk said, oh, let's make it pointier than it is. <laughs> and did you know that um, it was called the Starship now, but originally it was called BFR, which officially <laughs> yes. stood for Big Falcon Rocket, but unofficially I think everybody called it the uh, the Big Effing Rocket. Um, they changed that in, in 2018. Yeah, I look, I'm, uh, I'm a bit conflicted about all of this because many people despise Musk. To the point mm. that they won't buy a Tesla because, you know, it's associated with them. And others are absolute fanboys. I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, I'm very ambivalent. He's definitely, like, had some amazing impact in multiple industries. Yeah. More than, I mean, it's hard to point to someone else who's had as much of an impact in more than one area. But then he comes across with some just pretty reprehensible sort of positions or statements and and I don't really know how to feel about it. 
there's a bit of a Doctor Evil vibe going on, isn't there? <laughs> Sometimes Maybe. I don't know. But yeah, he he skates a he skates a line, doesn't he? Yeah, as someone who is uh, tormented internally by the ethics of consuming meat, how do you <laughs> go with the ethics of rocket launches and and space travel? I have no problem at all. Oh, really? None. I think you could make arguments, and some people do, about you know this money could be better spent locally on earth problems, etc. And although I don't even agree with that position, really, given how many stupid things we spend more money on, um, I think the big difference is that the return on investment, when we have a really mature, viable, economically, you know, sustainable space industry is, is enormous. And the amount of wealth and the amount of downstream benefits to humanity when we get a good spacefaring industry, uh, I think uh, are worth going hell for leather now, even if you could make arguments about the use of funds right now. So no problem at all. Huge fanboy of span, uh, space industry generally. Yeah. I think you're just very excited by the idea of sending rockets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the planet that we live on is probably far more important than any other planet and getting to that planet and starting a colony uh, hmm. i love to see a rocket take off and explode but I, I would love to see some of this energy and resources being put more into protecting our own planet that's just me maybe oh i think this could be another episode maybe we need a different podcast <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's time we uh we fire up the old boosters and, and launch into this episode <laughs> Gaylord. So let's listen into Matt Skalski chatting with medical physicist Zoe Brady, and then we'll be back for another chat after that. Uh, nice to meet you, Zoe. Looks like you're in your office at the, the hospital, or where are you at? I'm actually at home today because I have to do a four hour lecture straight after this online as well. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. That's intense. What are you uh, speaking on? Intense for the people listening as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm actually speaking to our radiology registrars, so radiologists in training, um, mm -hmm. and I'm giving them their physics lecture on CT, which they're mm -hmm. going to be examined on in less than a month. How much do you go into like a history? To, like, do you talk about first versus second generation, third generation scanners up to fourth? Well, I go into four hours worth. Right, yeah, I guess that's a lot. <laughs> um, and, and that covers everything. But um, that is a good question. We used to go into all of the generations, um, but I find mm. now that we're focusing a bit more on newer techniques. So we cover a bit on dual energy. We want to spend more time on the current clinical applications that they're using. Mm -hmm. So I do mention the words third generation so that they know that's what we're using predominantly in clinical practice these days, but I no longer put up the diagrams of how each one works and all the, all the previous generations. Maybe I'm misunderstanding here. My, I thought we were on fourth generation CT scanners. Am I wrong? Oh, well, third generation is the rotate, rotate, um, mm -hmm. where you have the x-ray tube rotating with the detector and they're aligned. The right. fourth generation is where you had a whole ring of detectors around um, the gantry and you'd have the x-ray tube on the inside rotating. And as you can imagine, that's a really expensive setup because you've got yeah. a, the detector array goes around the whole 360 degrees um, right. and is stationary. And multi-row detectors, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how many individual elements that would involve. So what we use now, what's more practical and what's in clinical implementation is actually third generation. I see. So when I hear like a 64 road scanner, that's still a third generation scanner typically? Yes, or? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it's got 64 detector rows in the Z direction. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the length of the patient, if you'd like to think yep. of it like that. And in the XY direction, it can have seven, 800 elements. And we've always had a lot of detector elements in that XY right. direction. But multi-detector means that we now have those multiple rows in the Z direction as well. Sure. So how do these ones prevent having like a ring artifact then? Is that just a multiple detector rows? Um, you can still get a ring artifact with a failed okay. element, but they usually get calibrated out these days through the gain correction. So mm -hmm. certainly it's it's still possible. See, now now I feel like I'm doing my CT lecture. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need to go and do it. I have questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the registrars, Matt. I get all these sorts of questions. <laughs> yeah. So when you're going up to like, say, you know, the higher slice scanners, what advantages, you know, what are the main advantages? Because I know there's a big cost difference as you increase those detector rows. 
Yeah, sure. I don't worry about the cost usually, <laughs> um, yeah. but but certainly one of the biggest advantages is your increased field of view. So mm. on our scanners that are the wider fields of view, we're able to image the whole heart in one rotation, for example. So you get that really improved temporal resolution by capturing mm. that total field of view in one go. So that that's one of the significant advantages. Okay. Yeah, cool. Not what I plan on starting with, but uh, no. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I don't, you know, know a ton about what your work looks like. I mean, obviously you have this lecture you're doing, you know, so you have an education component to your job. It sounds like, can you kind of give me an overview of what is a, like a, maybe a week or a month in, in a, uh, your career look like? Um, yeah, sure. It might take a year to tell you what a week is like because okay. we are intensely busy at the moment, but I'll give you a bit of a flavor of what I do. I'm a diagnostic imaging medical physicist and mm -hmm. I'm working in Australia. Um, I'm the chief imaging physicist in the hospital that I work in. So I have a small team of nuclear medicine and radiology physicists who work with me. And I think I describe no day as being routine. There's always okay. something that comes up that I'm not predicting to happen. And so responding to those ad hoc issues is probably one of my favorite parts of the job, even though it can be stressful when you just want to go sure. into work and have a coffee. Um, can you give me an example of like what, what, what one of those events might look like? Yeah, sure. So it might be an obstacle with an equipment install or a tender um, that calls for your attention, or it might be a radioactive spill. So sometimes those spills are in the course of clinical work, but other times they can be challenging situations. Like I've had a sewer leak that's gone out onto the front street um, in front of the hospital where we have trams running. So quite oh, a yeah. complicated situation and not something that I was expecting. And of course, occurs out of hours. <laughs> you, are you on call then? Yes. Or, or you're always on call? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. No, I'll, I'll get called. Um, I mean, it's the, the type of things that are radiation related um, are, are unique and infrequent. So mm -hmm. I will get those calls out. Our CEO and deputy CEO know my number, and when they think yeah. that it's um, if it's got the word radiation in it, they'll they'll give me a call usually. So other things that are more regular but not necessarily frequent is when we have a pregnant patient and there's questions about radiation exposure and the mm -hmm. risk to the fetus, then I'll have the radiologist usually call me and have a chat through the options for those patients and what we might the advice we might provide. Um, we also have staff exposures. So people will contact me if they're worried about radiation. We seem to have an increase in people forgetting to wear their lead aprons in oh, cath no. labs, interventional suites, fluoro. I think the reason for that is the increased PPE for COVID. So mm -hmm. they've got so many different layers on and they're in Makes the middle sense. of a case and they go, something feels a bit different. Oh, it's, it's light. <laughs> Where's yeah. the head? So in those situations, I do a, do a dose estimate of how much radiation they might have received, which is usually pretty low in those one-off situations. Sure. And then I counsel the staff who, who are usually quite concerned by that mm -hmm. stage that they've forgotten to wear it and, and what's the possible risks. Um, I also liaise with a lot of people across the organisation. So whether that's specialists, surgeons, radiologists, new med physicians, nursing staff, engineers, it's, it's really interesting work to deal with so many different types of people. Mm -hmm. Because the issues that arise can be quite unique. I have a good network of physicists within Australia that I will reach out to if we've got a situation that I haven't dealt with before. You know, it's really good to bounce those sorts of crisis situations off someone else yeah. and, and get a bit of an idea of how they may have solved it or if they've got any um, good tips for it. For sure. Yeah, because you can't be an expert in all things at all times, I suppose. No, the the range of things that we get asked, it feels like that sometimes. <laughs> and once you've worked in the industry for, for a length of time, you usually have come across most things. But on occasion, you still get the odd question that you just think, wow, that was left field. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So it sounds a bit different than maybe like a diagnostic uh, radiologist job where we kind of know what our day is going to look like for the most part. Most days are kind of similar. I mean, you throw in the random procedure or whatever, but 
Do you ever have like ebbs and flows where you kind of are like not busy? <laughs> <laughs> there is always something going on, I find, particularly since COVID, we just seemed to really ramp up in what we were responding to and what we were getting involved in. And it just has not quietened down at all. Mm. It's kind of interesting because you think about physics and COVID, it doesn't seem to be a lot of overlap. But what types of ways did that impact you? We tried to make improvements and help staff wherever we could during COVID. Initially, it was just my Excel skills. I think you'll find most physicists oh, have yeah. a lot of really good skills in Excel. Sure. I love Excel. And so it was just creating a dashboard around how many staff we had on, how many were furloughed, and trying to ensure that we had adequate staffing. This was right at the start when all of this was new to everyone. Mm-hmm. In Melbourne, where I live, we had a lot of lockdowns and we had a lot of cases compared to other mm-hmm. areas in Australia. And we're one of the lead hospitals in our state. And so we had a lot of patients, a lot of COVID patients under precautions in our hospital. So we Mm -hmm. looked at developing an existing method where you could take x-rays through glass so that the radiographer could stay outside of the patient's room who had COVID. Um, It reduced the risk to the radiographer. But the main benefit for us was that it meant that we weren't taking those mobile x-ray units into the room, which mm-hmm. meant that we'd have to have a full clean and decon if you brought it back out of the room. So we were trying sure. to reduce the amount of time involved because we were doing so many ex- chest x-rays. Mm-hmm. So we were reducing the amount of time involved, which meant that we could image more patients, get around to them all. But we were also reducing the risk for the radiographers, reducing a bit of that mental burden for them as well. We'd have yeah. two staff go with the x-ray unit. So one would go into the room and that would be allocated to them for that shift. And one would be able to stay out the whole time and just reduce their risk for that shift. It also reduced all the PPE changes that were happening every time sure. you went into a room and exited a room. So we did a lot of work around that and, and published it at the time. So that was quite an intense period. And then Mm -hmm. um, because of our physics skills in, I guess, everything to do with the electromagnetic spectrum, I got Mm -hmm. very involved in UVC and in-room decontamination. We've got some towers at the Alfred that we were just starting to deploy for in-room decontamination when COVID started. And Mm -hmm. interestingly, we had this issue at the start of the pandemic, probably not well publicised publicly, but there were not enough N95 masks in Mm -hmm. the state. And so I was commissioned to look at setting up a UVC laundry, basically, where Mm. we would take N95 masks, decontaminate them, and then return them to the users in the Mm -hmm. situation where masks were in short supply. Luckily, we never had to implement it, but I did a lot of hours on the UVC machine trying to set up this laundry. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because it's a situation you hope you never have to employ, but then when you never do it, then you feel like all that time was wasted. I've had projects like that. All all that time. (laughs) I know. I know way too much about UVC, although it was interesting to play around with something that wasn't ionizing radiation. (laughs) Yeah. What does like a academic career look like as a medical physicist? I suppose that exists. There's definitely some research labs. They tend to be more radiation oncology physics based. Um, Mm -hmm. There are a couple around Australia, but in in my field, we tend to be um, 100% clinical physicists. Mm -hmm. However, I've had a real interest in research and we are a teaching hospital. So I'm certainly encouraged to make time for research. You know, it's the perfect environment for it because we've got high-end technology, we have high patient throughput, we've got really interesting applications, we're quite an innovative hospital as well. So at the moment, the type of work that I'm looking at is cumulative imaging doses, particularly from CT and some of our interventional work for for our Mm -hmm. patients who return and have a lot of CT scans. I'm also looking at the clinical validation for AI CT reconstruction techniques. Mm -hmm. We often get these really fancy new things on our equipment. So in this case, it was an AI-based reconstruction technique on our CT scanners. And the question is, well, do you just switch it on or do you do some sort of validation before you implement it clinically? And so we came up with how we were going to do that, worked with the radiologists and the radiographers in that area to assess some images that were reconstructed Mm -hmm. in different ways and decide how we were going to implement it and what the challenges might be. So that was really interesting research and clinical work um, Mm -hmm. at the same time. 
we're also starting to look into the area of sustainability and the environmental load of running all our high-end equipment like MRI scanners and CT scanners. Are you talking about just like powering them or like the plastics yeah. they're made out of or what? At the moment, just the powering for them and whether the imaging that's been done on them and, and has all this energy consumption, whether it's justified in the first place. So like it's an interesting equation that um, health economists in particular are looking at. For sure. So I'm kind of thinking about, you know, how do you become you? I mean, do you have residents that you train in like PhD students, postdocs, or how does that work? Yeah, well, when I started, there was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trained on the job, which... That's what it sounds like, yeah. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because there was no one else with me. So I I trained myself (laughs) in a way. Um, But Mm -hmm. that's where... You know, I did a I did a PhD um, at the mm-hmm. same time when I was was starting to work in this clinical area and had a lot of colleagues and network people definitely mentored me at the start, mm-hmm. but now um, it's about a sort of fifteen plus years on since I started in this particular field and we have really good training programs now for medical physicists. Mm-hmm. So it's three years. It's conducted through a program um, from our college, the Australasian College of Physical Engineers and Scientists in Medicine. So we get a registrar now for three years in either radiology or nuclear medicine. It's a really thorough, comprehensive training program. I think it's very similar to what's done in the US, for example. Mm-hmm. And then there's a series of assessment through that program. And when the person gets through it successfully, they can then become registered as a certified medical physicist specialist. So now there's a really robust Mm -hmm. method of training, which gives them a good wide ranging background or knowledge in all modality areas. Whereas I've I picked things up as I've gone along as as they've become a priority. I've always been jealous when I've spoken to some of the international physicists who dedicate themselves to a particular modality like CT. Whereas Mm -hmm. in my hospital, when I started, I was the only radiology physicist. So I cover our whole fleet of equipment. And so usually it's whatever's the highest dose or biggest risk is where my attention is focused. So you probably don't have to worry about the ultrasound section too much, huh? Never even looked at an ultrasound. No, I'm I'm (laughs) joking. (laughs) I certainly teach the physics of it (laughs) um, to the radiology registrar. But no, I I can't spend any time or resources on ultrasound because it just doesn't stretch that far. We recently in a hospital in the Bay Area uh, had an MRI accident. I don't know if you saw a nurse had wheeled a um, patient in on just their regular hospital bed. And of course, that didn't go well. She ended up having a femur and pelvic fracture, it sounds like. So what type of MRI safety training do you do at your institution? Interestingly, in Australia, we have just set up a MR safety expert course, Mm -hmm. again, through the physics college. And so we're trying to move towards having that structure and that framework around the MR safety. We have a committee which we've actually called um, the SMAC committee. It's the mm-hmm. Safety of MR Advisory Committee. So we've had that in place for two years now and I facilitate that meeting and it's really good. It's got our MR radiologists and our MR radiographers and our physics team on that meeting and we review all the safety issues around MR. So we're looking through all our incidents and near misses. One of our big problems is where requesters don't indicate implant contraindications Mm -hmm. on the request form. So they'll tick, no, the patient doesn't have a pacemaker when they do. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do a lot to address that at the moment, actually. And it's interesting because for us, it's a lot of internal referrers where that occurs. And they are under the assumption that, oh, you already know about that pacemaker in radiology. So we didn't think we had to tick it again. So it's little Mm -hmm. things like that where not all of that information may necessarily be there for that request and how important it is every single time to Mm -hmm. indicate it. We'd like more sort of foolproof, fail-safe systems um, in our electronic requesting system, but at the moment that hasn't been possible. So we're really focusing on educating why we need to know every time. And certainly just that oversight of the SMAC committee has been a way of recognising how many near misses we might have Mm -hmm. and that we do need a concerted effort to continue to address those. Do other staff outside of imaging get any MRI safety education like nurses? 
because like in this case, I think the MR tech had wandered off to go to the bathroom or something. Yeah, I can't think of a situation where we'd never have the MR radiographer there. And luckily, we've got a couple of scanners that are join joint control rooms. So we've always got mm -hmm. a lot of staff floating around. Anyone mm -hmm. in that area needs to fill in a consent form as well, which is where we then explain all the risks and they watch a safety video as well. So if they come into that MR area in any way, then then they will have been advised of those risks and, and have to fill in a checklist and a form. Um, sure. I also, as radiation safety officer across the hospital, I present a lot of talks on ionising radiation safety. So I mm -hmm. always throw in a little bit about MR because people often get it confused, but I right. also find it an opportunity where I can just flag it. And that includes the cleaning staff as well. Right. So I do try to address it whenever I can, just so that they've got a bit of awareness. But then when mm -hmm. they enter that MR environment, the MR radiographers are responsible for that safety training and the consent forms. Yeah, I don't know what the with whether or the breakdown was it it wasn't my institution but um it sounds terrible but i might look it up because especially modern day incidents which help remind people mm -hmm. that there is a safety risk here this does happen yeah i, I think i retweeted it so uh, last week or something you should be able to find it okay thanks Andrew was telling me that you uh guys started a mobile ct unit at your institution you've done a lot of work with that yeah, we've, we've actually got mobile MR and mobile oh. CT now. Um, they're interesting modalities. We put both machines into our intensive care unit, so they're only um, restricted to that area. We don't use them hospital-wide. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the MR was much easier to install, oh, I felt, relatively for me, <laughs> um, yeah. in terms of safety risks. I, I mean, there are some safety risks, but it's a pretty small device mm -hmm. and was a bit easier to implement. But Interestingly, I'm finding that the sort of clinical use of it is a bit slower to eventuate. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's more applicable to doing sort of routine non-contrast brain scans. We're looking at a body of work with that one for our ECMO patients. The ICU specialists would really like to use, use it for those patients, but they have a lot more metal risk um, because mm -hmm. they've got so many devices attached to them. So we are looking at the safety implications of that. And actually, it's not so much the patient, but as the scanner gets wheeled into the room, the actual ECMO device itself and whether the impellers within that device are affected by the magnetic field. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the research areas that we're looking into at the moment. But with the mobile CT, it, it's just a whole different kettle of fish in terms of satisfying the regulatory requirements and ensuring mm -hmm. that staff and patients are safe. And really, when you think about it, CT scanners, as we know them, are typically fixed and used in a room that's really easy to shield with lead. So that's how right. do you have this situation where you have a mobile CT and everyone can now just stand around it? It's, it's mm -hmm. not as simple as that. So how do we achieve that same level of shielding and safety that we can when we can shield the walls in a fixed CT scanner? So we had to do a lot of measurements around it and come up mm -hmm. with a really good work instruction on how we were going to use it and to feel confident that we had the safety controls in place and our regulator even visited to have a look at the whole process and the scanner. Do you have like mobile barrier walls that you wheel in or? Yeah, so we actually evacuate the cubicle of any um, visitors or staff that's adjacent. We The patient mm -hmm. in the adjacent cubicle can stay, but everyone else must leave. So we use distance um, to our right. advantage in that way. And then the corridor immediately outside the cubicle where the mobile CT scan is happening, that corridor needs to be emptied. And it's only a metre or so, and people just need mm -hmm. to stand back. And the radiographer controls that. And the radiographer stands behind a mobile lead shield. So we have okay. that in place. They're the ones up close. Mm -hmm. In Australia, these CT scanners also have lead curtains on the actual CT scanner itself. Okay. It's a bit hard to close them in around these patients tightly because they've got quite a bit of tubing and different things coming off them. But mm -hmm. we, we ensure that those are closed as much as possible as well to reduce that radiation scatter to the adjacent areas. 
So we ended up doing what we call area monitoring after we um, clinically installed this CT scanner. And the results are really very rewarding because they're exactly as I've calculated where oh, we nice. expected to get some radiation, where we're doing all our QA work and daily calibrations. We had decided to shield just one wall there. And it turns out that that was, that was warranted. So we did get a measurement there on the other side of the wall where we put the shielding in. We've got zero radiation and and that's where we've got a patient who in a patient cubicle. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're really satisfied with how it's been implemented to date. It's getting a lot of good use. It's similar to the mobile MR in the sense that it's for head scanning as well. Um, but nice. ICU doctors seem to really like it. The radiologists think the image quality is good. We, we actually, um, I think we've had one repeat scan because it was undiagnostic. Okay. But otherwise, they've been really happy with that image quality. And it's funny, the the main problem we've had is where the floor in the ICU cubicle is not flat and the CT oh. scanner wobbles. So it's different oh, from your usual CT scanner where the patient moves, the patient bed slides through the gantry. In the mobile CT scanner, the scanner moves over the patient and rolls over the patient. So hmm. where we have an uneven floor, which you can't even see yourself the scanner starts to wobble as it's yeah. taking the image and you get this terrible motion artifact through the images oh, no. and you have to have to repeat so that's been one of the differences this is a going to be a really ignorant question but is there any role for like leaded paint in in that it's not <laughs> enough lead it's probably not enough the wall <laughs> that the wall that we put it in um where we put some lead in was about a mill thick of lead okay. i think paint would be i, I don't know what thick too many coats paint would be <laughs> yeah you might be there a while painting layer yeah. after layer the lead curtains that we've got on um that come with the scanner uh one one set is 0.5 mil thick and one set's i think about 0.2 mil thick okay so that sort of gives you an idea of, of the type of lead shielding that we're using on them. The mobile MR is kind of interesting. I, I've seen some uh, mobile MR units for like extremities for like orthopedic clinics. I suppose mm-hmm. that your unit that you guys are using is, you said is more, more for brain and head stuff. Yeah, I think it can be used for pediatrics as well, but we're in adult hospitals. So for, mm-hmm. for us, it's really the, the head scanning that it's, that it's found application for. What's the um, field strength on that? Yeah, I knew you were about to ask me that, <laughs> and I don't know off the top of my head. I, I have a, I have a feeling, but I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So, okay. um, it, but it is much lower. It is much, yeah. much lower. But the image quality. My understanding from the radiologist, and I, you know, I have to preface this: I'm, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a radiologist. Is mm-hmm. that it's for routine scans, so you might already have prior imaging available for the patient. Um, so it's certainly not applicable in every circumstance. But if you're doing routine non-contrast scans, they find it quite acceptable. Awesome. I, I don't know uh, how much you want to dive into this, but I was kind of thinking about like, you know, if you're looking to the future, you know, things you expect that might be coming down the pipeline that you are going to have to deal with. Like, I know. I've heard some uh, things about like slot scanning, radiography being a new low dose technique uh, and, you know, all the dentists and stuff are getting into comb beam CTs and that might expand to wider usage. Do you have any opinion on those technologies? Yeah, um, sure. I I had to look up the slot scan radiography. Um, I guess in your area, you do a lot of bone imaging, don't you? So Mm -hmm. it it looks very relevant. It's not something that we're looking at implementing yet, although there's some tomosynthesis options on some of our newer x-ray units. And I think they're, they're sort of along that direction as well. Cone beam CT, definitely we're seeing it everywhere. Um, we don't have a lot of dental applications at the hospital I'm in, but 3D spins, which is cone beam CT on our angio or interventional units, is getting a lot more use, particularly in all the neuro work being done mm-hmm. there. So I think, you know, we'll definitely see that be more widespread. We're asking all the time by orthopedic for these sort of 3D spins in the theatre area as well. Um, And there's certainly Mm -hmm. some devices that are capable of doing that now. I think that really talk of the town at the moment is probably photon counting CT. I think we've got our first scanner in Australia that can do that. We don't have that yet at um, our hospital, but I think that that will be a really interesting development and we'll see a lot more of those commercially. Can you explain that a little bit, some clinical applications? 
If you think of dual energy CT at the moment and some of the applications in being able to identify different things like gout, like if you see Mm -hmm. those sort of colour maps. So if we can look at the exact energy of the photons, it allows us to discriminate a lot more in the Mm -hmm. imaging. So there will be a lot of applications if we can actually, or they can do it already, um, Mm -hmm. record the energy of the photon that's exiting the body. And there's a lot of publications coming out around that already. And the other area is just the whole body PET CT. So there's a couple of these in Australia. We'll probably look at installing one as well, just getting that whole body acquisition because the field of view is so large. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's just huge benefits for that. And I think that there's also interesting dynamic imaging that can be done as a result. Um, And so I think that we'll see a lot of change in that area um, with that technology. Yeah. When you're teaching physics to the residents and, or registrars and stuff, what do you find to be like the topics people struggle with the most? I assume probably the MR physics, like talking about phase encoding and stuff can always confuse people. They absolutely tear their hair out when they get to MR. Originally, we start off with all the x-ray physics and CT and they feel like it's so foreign when they just start, but then they get a really good feel for it and you can throw phrases at them like half value layer or beam quality and they don't get scared anymore. And then yeah. um, you, then you delve into MR and they say, what is this? This is just so foreign. Um, and mm-hmm. so I think that MR is the one that usually scares them the most and, and feels like the steep deepest learning curve. I mean, we do ultrasound and nuclear medicine is usually a little bit challenging for them as Mm -hmm. well, but we probably spend the most time on x-ray physics and a lot of radiation safety. Yeah. There's been this push towards, you know, not using gonadal shielding and these things. Do Mm. you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think that Culturally in Australia, we've probably already made the shift without formalising it in policy per se. And I know Mm -hmm. there's probably a different discussion happening in your part of the world and it's, it's a bigger cultural shift and harder to accept. But here, um, people understand the scientific basis for why the recommendation is to no longer use that contact patient shielding, that mm-hmm. the evidence is just no longer there. The, the risks of using the shielding are much greater than the benefit of using mm-hmm. it. Our doses are much lower with the technology we have these days versus 70 years ago when these recommendations right really first came into place. It's really hard to place the shielding in exactly the right spot so that you're not obscuring anatomy. Mm-hmm. It can cause artifacts in the in the image that might cause a repeat. And more importantly, with our newer technology and things like automatic exposure control, if the mm-hmm. shielding's in the wrong spot, it will end up driving up your dose and, and right. giving a higher dose to the patient. One of the main reasons for the recommendations or some of the legal requirements around using the shielding was about the risks of hereditary effects. But we probably understand a bit more about those risks now. And the lifespan study of the atomic bomb survivors has looked Mm -hmm. through several generations or followed several generations now. And those effects have not been observed in humans. We do Mm -hmm. have the animal studies that show the effects. So there's still something to investigate there. But at the low doses that we're talking about for diagnostic imaging, that risk-benefit equation no longer Mm -hmm. falls on the side of using shielding. And that's kind of like getting into the debate about the linear non-threshold models kind of obsolete at this point, too, that they're, you know, for most people, there probably is some threshold because we're reparative organisms and do you spend much time talking about the linear and non-threshold model and Alara and that stuff? Yeah, no, no, we definitely teach it to them. They are required to understand it and they, mm-hmm. they do get examined on it and that the basis of our radiation protection programs is still underpinned by the linear no-threshold mm-hmm. model. But we try to give them the basis, the scientific basis for how the linear no-threshold model is derived so that they can make their own educated opinion or decision mm-hmm. about it. I was involved in the very large study conducted in Australia, which we published in BJM um, 
I think in 2013, where we okay. looked at 11 million Australians um, and 680,000 of those who'd had CT scans as children. And then we linked with the cancer outcomes in that cohort and demonstrated an increased risk, a very small risk, but an right. increased risk of cancer amongst that cohort of children compared to children in Australia who hadn't had those CT scans so um, I know there's a lot of controversy in this low dose region where diagnostic medical imaging occurs, but mm -hmm. there are the epidemiology studies now that are showing that from diagnostic exposures, there are increased risks. And I think that that needs to be, I guess, acknowledged and that this is why the justification decision is so important. I think it's quite an abstract decision that radiologists mm -hmm. need to undertake each time they're justifying and approving um, any type of imaging request, but it is still a pertinent decision when we're trying to reduce risk. For sure. I know I've, I've been reading a lot, you know, there's been this pushback against the linear non-threshold model and, you know, that we're preventing people from getting imaging causes more harm than the minuscule risk that increased. But then I, you know, I read a study a while back when I was in residency that showed there was a small but measurable increase in, for example, meningiomas with dental x-rays. And it's like, you know, that's one of the lowest dose things you can have done. And yet still is it has a measurable risk with it. So we have to get the balance right and we have to yeah. have the discussion. And I think that these types of very small risks are hard to prove and to have the evidence for. You need such large cohort studies and such long follow up to just um, to prove that that risk exists or that the radiation is causative of those mm -hmm. cancers. But that's work that needs to be done. It's the epidemiologists who who are really working hard. And there's I think there's 17 odd studies now that that do show that link or have have looked at large cohorts. So they certainly are occurring, but they will mm -hmm. take time to have that really conclusive evidence. We used to treat people with ankylosing spondylitis with whole body radiation and it worked, but they all got leukemia. Well, I shouldn't say they all, but a large percentage got leukemia as a result of that. Well, that is one of one of the studies that is quite informative. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know that you said you have something you have to get to. I do. I was just looking at the time that I, I will have a group of registrars waiting for their <laughs> lecture. <laughs> all right. Well, it was nice chatting with you and I appreciate uh, you sharing your experience and uh, kind of giving us a little insight into what your uh, your day looks like. Yeah, likewise, Matt. Really interesting talking to you on the other side of the world. Um, thank yeah. you for taking the time. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Hopefully you can talk again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, awesome work there by Zoe. She seemed to handle Skalski's diversions quite well, <laughs> even, even the leaded paint. <laughs> Well, and the meningioma. Uh, I mean, the meningioma caused by mobile phones and radio radiation has been sort of coming and going all the time. I think mm. I did a little bit of reasoning about the uh, meningioma dental x-ray thing. And it does sound like with older equipment in the past that there may have been a small effect size, but that it's mm -hmm. very unlikely to be the case now. So just for all you kids out there, dental x-rays, if necessary, are very safe and don't worry about getting brain tumours. Oh, so I can stop putting the aluminium foil around my head each day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, quite a wide-ranging interview. Uh, anything particular that caught your interest there, Gaylord? Well, I was glad that people doing procedures without wearing lead is, is common and it wasn't just me because... I remember doing that and, and feeling like I was really sprightly and full of yep. energy during it. I'm not sweating at all today. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that also struck me as interesting was, the, and I've experienced this, the, the disconnect between personal concern about radiation dose versus how easygoing we are about ordering tests and additional mm -hmm. uh, views, et cetera. And when I was a fellow overseas, uh, I got some chest pains. And it, it turned out that it was probably Starbucks coffee and having like eight shots of coffee in, in a day. <laughs> That'll do it. I have quite a strong cardiac uh, family history. So I got a CT coronary artery. This was when I was, I don't know, 35 or something. And during the injection, the IV disconnected. And so they needed to run it again. And so <laughs> I had two coronary angios uh, back to back. And I was so emotionally wrecked by the radiation dose thought of it 
And then you go to work and it's like, oh, they moved a bit. Just repeat that. Yeah. <laughs> you wonder how many tests we would do if we all had to uh, bear the brunt of the radiation ourselves. The other thing that I thought about when I was listening to this interview is in some ways I'm thankful that there is some risk from radiation because can you imagine how much imaging would be performed, how many <laughs> unnecessary studies, how many incidental findings we'd be following up if there was no risk from ionizing radiation. It's almost like it's a, a hurdle that we kind of need to have to prevent overdiagnosis. Well, I don't know. We don't have that for MR, do we? And still, you don't get the sense that there's this great reticence to order a test. No. People seem to be going hell for leather. A family history of headache is enough to get you a scan these days. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about AI recently as well. And, you know, one of the concerns radiologists have is that AI will read all these studies and we won't have any work to do. But the reality is that we're not patient or request constrained as a, as a profession. If we suddenly were able to perform and report twice as many studies, clinicians would gladly order twice as many studies mm -hmm. as well. And now that we have mobile scanners, I mean, you could build a CT into the head of every uh, ICU bed and just uh, daily routine full body ICU yeah. patient CTs. Well, well, it is interesting. There were a few new little techniques described in that um, in that chat there. So we've got the the X ray through glass that we've done mm. at the Alfred. Those images are really really good. They're a little bit lordotic. So how's it done? So in ICU, you have the the isolation rooms where you've got you know the glass doors. Yeah. And so the X ray machine doesn't need to go into the actual cubicle. It can stay on the outside and then you can shoot your x-rays through the glass um, and you only need one radiographer to go into the room to put the detector behind right. the patient. And so I guess you're just a little bit further away from the patient than you would normally be. So that changes the geometry a little bit and you get a little bit of a lordotic chest x-ray. But other than that, it looks like a great chest right. x-ray. And so it just meant that they could uh, perform chest x-rays more rapidly and not have to decontaminate the x-ray machine every time ah, yes, um, so they could rapidly go around the ICU and take x-rays. Zoe underplayed it a little bit in that interview. That was actually quite a groundbreaking study that they published on that and changed the way people took x-rays mm -hmm. on COVID patients around the world um, at a really kind of the COVID peak. Um, the other thing she talked about was the mobile CT and the mobile MRI for heads mm -hmm. in ICU patients. The CT images, I'll say, are fantastic. Right. In fact, compared to, I won't name the manufacturer, but the CT scanners that we have in our emergency department, um, <laughs> the actual mobile head CTs are often as good, if not better. Yeah. So they're really, really good for, you know, those ICU patients that you would struggle to transport. They've got multiple leads coming out of them and the ICU doctors, you know, it's going to take them an hour out of their day to transport the patient down to the CT scanner and then back up to ICU and instead you can perform the scan in ICU itself. Um, so really good for those, mm -hmm. those post-operative, um, post-subdural kind of brain CTs. I love the uh, description of the CT wobbling. It made me think of those uh, dishwashers that start yeah. moving across the laundry. Yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it until, until Zoe described it, the idea that it would be the patient that stays still and the scanner yeah. moves <laughs> over them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But yeah, it does seem a bit like the old the old washing, washing machine moving across the floor. Um, so the other one is the mobile MR brains. And I must say those images are not, are not fantastic in mm. my experience. It's a very low field strength, um, so right. 0 0.064 Tesla reasonable images but certainly nowhere near the quality of the the diagnostic MR scanner. It doesn't surprise me so much that you say that the mobile CT looks better than some of the newer scanners that you have uh, in your department because in my experience the most modern CT scanners we have the CT brains don't look as good as some of the older mm -hmm. uh, generation. I don't know whether I'm sure the dose is much lower and there's all sorts of um algorithms to reduce dose and improve you know the appearance of them but they often have a a slightly smudgy look compared to CTs from a decade or even two decades ago the, the kind of scanners that I trained on seem to do better job of gray white matter differentiation than some of the much newer fancier scanners is that your experience as well a lot of it comes down to that quality assurance doesn't it and i think that was mentioned in this 
episode mm. as well because I think you can you know change the parameters quite wildly on the scanners and sometimes yeah. we have the opposite sometimes we have scanners that are very grainy not very smudgy and have very very heightened gray white differentiation so the contrast resolution is really really good but the image looks quite grainy so you can kind of go either way yeah that was an interesting comment about you know you get a new piece of software or technology and how much QA do you need to do on it and mm. uh, do you just sort of switch it on because there's lots of equipment that you don't do QA on that you just trust works as it's meant to but when it comes to imaging especially CT and MR where it's not just out of the box plug and play uh, you have to massage them to get them to what you want them to look like. And I'm not sure whether that's because every department has its own way that they want images to look slightly or whether they're just not yet to the point of just turning them on. I mean, you don't do that with your computer or your camera or other equipment. You don't set with fiddle with hundreds of settings. And yet with MR, it takes you know weeks and months to get it just right. One of those things where... Very thankful that you have somebody like Zoe in the background who goes through all of that quality assurance process, particularly with the ionizing forms of of imaging. I'm sure there are places that that don't have Mm. that kind of support. Probably most. So we had, uh, as an aside, we've recently had to uh, move all of our EMR scanners. We're in the process of moving them all because um, they've built a railway under the road outside our hospital. And uh, everything got approved and the tunnels were built and the, everything was happening until someone realized that 100 tons of metal moving quickly 30 meters away from MR <laughs> scanners is going to cause a problem. And uh, despite trying to find solutions with active shielding, et cetera, the only solution that's viable is to move our entire MR department. So it's oh, been wow. moved to the ninth floor and we had four new scanners craned in on the same day. And so our physicist and our MR techs and everyone are in the process of bedding down four scanners at once, which, again, thank goodness we have these people. Yeah. And thank goodness I'm not involved. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking as well. Uh, all right, we probably should uh, wrap this episode up. Frank, how can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. And you can, of course, email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas or feedback you might have. And if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass to our online course. And, of course, that includes our upcoming conference in uh, July. So doing that, not only do you get access to all of this material, but you also help us give the conference and all our courses away to free to everyone in low and middle income countries. We've got lots and lots of lectures coming in at the moment from our international speakers for the event, workshops, panel discussions. It's going to be an amazing event, plus a cocktail of a day each day. Gail. There is, and I'm currently editing my wife's talk on uh, MR of placental accreta spectrum disorder, so learning lots about placenta. Which is... <laughs> I'm sure you're finding that very useful information. <laughs> And what else can people do, Frank? And don't forget that you can also help us out by leaving a five-star, no less, five-star. If you can click six stars, do it. Review in the podcast (laughs) app of your choosing. Awesome. Well, uh, let's get out of here, Gaylord. We mentioned Elon. We mentioned SpaceX. So I think we can officially give ourselves a blue tick for this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let me do the sign-off. So we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay rad. (laughs) (laughs) See you next week, mate. Bye-bye.